Well, good afternoon and thank you. Uh, delighted to see so many of you here. And we have right now, I think, a very unique opportunity. This might go down in the record for me. I get to have two dialogues with two county executives uh, today. And, and our current county executive, Mark Elridge, is a longtime friend of Montgomery College and has been a wonderful champion for education. Uh, and he has been primarily as also as part of his brand, as Dr. Williams talked about earlier, as one who advances equity uh, in our community, in our county. He was elected to the Montgomery County Executive Office in November of 2018. And he has previously served uh, three terms or 12 years on the council as a member at large. Uh, he served as the council member in the Tacoma Park City Council from 1987 to 2006. And for 17 years, he was a teacher at Rolling Terrace Elementary School in uh, Tacoma Park. As a council member, he was the chief sponsor of several landmark pieces of legislation and programs. He led the successful effort to increase the Montgomery County minimum wage uh, to, in coordination with surrounding jurisdictions from 11, uh, to eleven fifty an hour, eventually to $15 an hour. He was the first elected official to propose building a bus rapid transit or BRT system throughout the county to address Montgomery County's transportation and environmental problems. And ground was broken in the fall of 2018 for the first BRT line, which, run, which will run along Route 29. Not only has the county held its own two-day racial equity institute, as Council President Navarro mentioned earlier, which was fantastic. What I found to be incredible as the county executive, this wasn't even a couple weeks into his uh, leadership role as the county executive, and he was there. And he championed some powerful policy initiatives around early childhood education as well. Uh, these will ensure that more families will have access to important benefits, uh, access to work, childcare, and early education, are all equity issues, and it's wonderful to have a county uh, that lives its values out loud in these spaces. I think the multiplier effect is definitely at play here <laughs> when you have two or more uh, communities that are equally committed to equity, and you see that both in our county executive and our county council. Uh, they've been very valuable partners with the, council, uh, the college and have really worked to create space and place for multiple communities to have an opportunity to talk about social justice, to engage in the act of social justice. And right now, we're just very grateful to have him here for his leadership and his commitment. So I have a few questions. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, one of my friends emailed me or texted me one, said, I see you're gonna be emailing, or excuse me, having a dialogue with a council, uh, with the county executive, would you ask him this question? So I told Mr. Elridge the question, and I said, I won't ask that first. Maybe later we'll slide into it, and if he wants to get into it, he can. So as you know, we live in a community where our school system is majority uh, minority. We live in a county that is in large part majority minority. You're at a college where 72% of our students are students of color. Um, when we think about the fact that we're in this uh, conversation that you and the council has led around racial <coughs> equity, why is this work relevant right now in Montgomery County? Because some people would think we're in a post-racial world, why is this relevant in Montgomery County? I think the notion that we're in a post-racial world is delusional. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, be, I think it'll be, let's be blunt about this. Um, you know, particularly when it comes to the, to the black community. Uh, they endured 300 years of absolutely no freedom, and then a make-believe 100 years, 100 and more years after emancipation, in which legally they weren't slaves, but all the structures of slavery and oppression were pretty much left in place. And you could free people, but if you free people and they can't vote and they don't have access to capital mm. and can't develop property, uh, they don't build capital and they don't build experiences like other people were able to build experiences in this society. And then you get to the 60s and we pass legislation. Legislation is nice. Legislation didn't give anybody who didn't have an education an education. It didn't give anybody who was living in the slums that dot most of this country a different house. It didn't give them the wherewithal to get a different house. It didn't change the fact that the kids who were being raised in these conditions would have parents who often couldn't find work because when the cities changed, the jobs evacuated from the cities. It's not like people moved to the cities become unemployed. The first movement of African Americans to the cities was to get jobs. 
they stayed there and the jobs left and the white community left. When I was a kid, we used to call the red line the white flight line mm. because we'd get people from the suburbs into DC and you could go underground and not see anything. And that's, I'm growing up in the 60s, you gotta remember that. Um, actually, I, I was born in 49, so I, I was in DC when the school system integrated there. Um, I was pretty profoundly affected by what I saw happen in my neighborhood and, and with the experiences I had with black kids because it was really clear that uh, their paths were different. Um, I, I told the story at my inauguration, I think, but um, I had a friend across the street and his sister graduated from Coolidge High School. I was like nine years old. My mother had seventh grade education. My father was a postal clerk, sat in what was called the cage down at Union Station, sorting mail. And we went over to her graduation party and at one point I walked up to her and I asked her you know, what college she was going to, going to. Don't ask me how I knew about college. I think my parents had subconsciously been training me for it. But I asked her that question and she said to me, I'm not going to college. My uncle has a college degree. He's just a janitor. It doesn't make any difference. And I couldn't fully process that as a nine-year-old. It struck me as out of tune, but I didn't fully understand it, but that conversation has stuck with me my entire life. And when I would talk to people about what's, why things are the way they are, I would talk about me being a kid who thought about possibilities and couldn't imagine anything I couldn't do. I mean, later my parents told me, you're not going to college unless you get a scholarship. But I basically could think about anything, and here's somebody who is already precluded the, the best path forward that anybody would have at that point. And I thought about how I raised my children, and I wondered about what she would tell her children. And I wonder how her experiences would color the message she gave to her kids. Mm. And when the civil rights legislation passed, would she just shrug her shoulders and say, so what? And would she live in a neighborhood that had continued to crumble because they didn't have the economic means to get out of it and how that would affect her children? So I look at the work in Montgomery County, sort of like it's, it's what has to happen in this country. I'm not doing this because this is a Montgomery County issue. I think it's fundamentally an American issue. And if we don't come to terms with race, we've never had those moments that other countries have had of reconciliation, which first of all requires laying bare what exactly got done and what got laid, what got done to who and then having a discussion about it. We've avoided having that discussion. The moment might have been after the Civil War. We blew that moment. The second moment might have been after the Civil Rights legislation was passed, and we blew that moment. And I gotta tell you, we're sitting in a place now, we're 50 something years past this landmark legislation, and there's a whole bunch of people in this country think problem solved, mm. the legislation was passed. What are you complaining about? And then add to that, you had a black president. And so everything must be perfectly fine. And the flip side of that is if people aren't doing well, it must be something about them, not about the system. And that's the persistent racism that we have to deal with. So when you think about this from a government perspective and a policy level, what does a racial <clears throat> equity uh, framework look like? How, how, does that, how does that show up in the public space? I, I think it shows up in, in the evaluative tools that that policymakers use to look at the decisions that they make. I mean, I'll be blunt. Um, I've been very unhappy with a number of zoning decisions precisely because there are large minority communities that will never come back to the housing we're gonna replace. Um, we've done this multiple times. In a racial equity lens, we just did the Veers Mill Plan. If you had a racial equity lens, you would have said 45% of these people earn 200% of poverty. They're almost all minority. They don't qualify for MPDUs. The only people you're giving, not even preference, the only person who gets first dibs on it are people who had two and three bedroom apartments, which were about a little less than half of the population there. The people who lived in one bedroom apartments get no preference. And preference just means they call you first. And when they call you, they ask you, what's your income? And if your income is too low, you don't qualify. They ask you, what's your credit history? If, you're, if your credit history is bad, you don't qualify. And by the way, how many kids in your family? 
And if it's a two bedroom apartment and you're sitting there with five kids, you don't qualify. So we've offered them something which most of them won't be able to take care of. And we think we did a great thing because we're getting a bunch of MPDUs. And the reality is these people who we're gonna displace will never get access to those MPDUs, which are priced for teachers and firefighters and policemen. And I have no idea where they're gonna go in Montgomery County. Because if you're at those income levels, go find the $750 or $800 apartment in Montgomery County. I wish you good luck, because you won't find it. And a racial equity lens, if there had been one in place, somebody would have looked at that zoning decision and said, what about these people? Don't talk to me about the units you're gonna build. They would have said, talk to me about the lives of the people that you're going to affect. This is the clearest thing I can, can say to people. When I got in trouble, some of you may remember, I made this untoward remark about the Purple Line development in, in my neighborhood. And I referred to, I didn't refer to the Purple Line as ethnic cleansing, but I referred to the zoning decision as ethnic cleansing because they basically looked at all the apartments, if you know Long Branch, which is Piney Branch and Flower Avenue going out to university, and it rezoned all the apartments for new housing. And they did the same talk about, well, you know, we'll get MPDUs. And if you knew anything about the Long Branch community, you'd know they were never gonna get into the MPDUs. And when I used that term, and I said that what you're doing here is ethnic cleansing, some people do it with a gun, some people do it with a pen, but the result's the same. Park and Planning and the and council staff redrew, withdrew the proposal to rezone it. Um, I got criticized for using untoward language, I suppose, but the effect was that those people will get to keep their housing at least for a little while longer. So equity lenses should be applied broadly. If we're doing a health program, we should think about what's the impact on the communities we're providing health care to. I was educated by the African American um, health partnership, um, mm -hmm. because I had this discussion. We were talking past each other. I was saying Montgomery provides services to the population based on percentages of um, illness, you know, how much hypertension, how much diabetes. Every group, every subgroup gets services in proportion to the diseases, and they kept saying it's not equitable. I kept saying, but it's proportional, and they were, but it's not equitable. And finally, they explained what equitable meant, and they said, you know, our folks are have shorter lifespans than everybody else. You can treat the diseases, it's not gonna change our lifespans because there are other things going on. And it was at that moment when I wish they'd had that conversation 12 years earlier because it was a really clarifying moment for me when I understood what they were talking about. Mm. And you know, you know, again, I've said this before, as a white person, I've never thought about being white. Any of you in the room, you've never had to think about it being white, never walked into a room and said, you know, what's this employer gonna think of me? I'm a white person. Yeah. Or walked into a store and say, what are people gonna think about me? I'm a white person. Um, we've never experienced that. And I'd flip and say, so what's it like if you experienced that your entire life? If you experienced that from the time you're a kid to the time you're an adult, and it never ends. Um, that's, that's damning to me. And so we talk about the racial equity work. I mean, it's trying to make us aware of the effects we have. But I also got to say, all the work we do at the community level is only a part because we've got to change how people think and how people feel. Because I could have policies that identify a bad zoning decision. I could have a policy that says, you know, you need to do something and more for this community because what you're thinking about doing isn't going to get the job done. But what do I do about all the white folks out there? And it's not just white folks, frankly, who have perceptual views of the African-American community that they are using and coding every day when they interact. And that's America's challenge. And that's why I said, this is, you know, I'm not doing this because of Montgomery County. I want to be part of a movement to try to change this country so we can have a conversation so you don't have people celebrating the Civil War and Civil War heroes, these are just traitor dogs. Um, they really are, I have no sympathy for them. Um, you know, my view, all the land of the state should have been broken up. These people should have been disbarred from politics, disbarred from voting, their state should have gone to the people who worked that land, and we probably wouldn't be in this mess today. Mm. Sounds like you're talking about reparations. I'm trying to figure out what's the best way to do this. Right. 
that was there. I shared with him a friend that texted me and said, you should ask the council, uh, uh, county council uh, president, excuse me, county executive about um, the, his thoughts on reparations. So I mentioned it to him. He says, we're going to figure that out. You know, I'm still trying to figure out what that means. But when you try to address or redress historical systemic um, effects on populations of people, one cannot have those conversations absent, I believe, one about how you began to write that vote. As you, you yeah. so eloquently said, historically, if you did not have access to these things and you were systematically prevented from having them, oh, and by the way, a whole culture was designed around your, your ability not to have them and to mm -hmm. do it on your back. One cannot have a substantive conversation in my mind uh, without having some doc conversation down the line about reparations. And we've done it before historically. We just haven't had the courage, I think, to talk about it because of the sheer number. As my grandfather said at 98 when he died, I'm still waiting on my 40 acres and a mule. Yeah. And There's some other people. You might want to yeah. think about reparations for Native Americans. Oh, I completely agree. And, completely and the agree. Japanese who were deprived of their, stripped yeah. of their land, yes. never got it back. Yep. But you know, when you talk about reparations, the real question, and this is what I wrestle with, is how do you pay it back? How do you do it? Is it a check to people? Or is it going into the cities and saying, we're going to rebuild where people live? Mm -hmm. um, checks are, you know, you get a pile of money, it doesn't mean you're going to be able to get what you need for it. Right. Um, if, if, if we were to say, you know, instead of how many B1, well, not, not B1s anymore, but F35s <laughs> and all that other nonsense, which people seem to have no limit on how much of that stuff they could build, what if you took that money and said, we're going to rebuild? these cities. We're going to take down this housing. We're going to provide decent housing for people. We're going to put in jobs programs. It would cost money, but it might go to money, might be money spent in a way that lets the community a, start to thrive and provides opportunities that everybody else has. Make sure the housing is owned rather than rented. This is one thing I'm looking about in the county is trying to work with the nonprofits who do so much well-intentioned rental housing work in the county. Can I get them to think about shifting toward ownership? Mm. You know, because if, you, if I protect, I'm a big fan of rent control, but I know if you live in a rent controlled apartment for 30 years, at the end of the day, you're not going to get a second mortgage to send your kid to school. You're not going to take an equity line when your kid's ready to buy a house and hand them $20,000 because you got no equity. And so as long as we continue to offer rental housing to poor people, as opposed to figure out, can I at least turn the rental housing into owned housing? I am not going to change this dynamic about who accumulates capital. Mm -hmm. And if you're in a capitalist system and you're not accumulating capital, you lose. It's, it's pretty straightforward. Yep. You can't play the game. You, know, you don't have the money to borrow to start a business. You don't have the money to help your kids. That's a pretty tough spot. Mm. So when I think about this work, and I'd love to hear what you think Montgomery College uh, can and should be doing as we start thinking about issues of racial equity and we start thinking about governmental policy and actions that could help advance uh, a world or at least a community in a county where uh, we are uh, more thoughtfully engaged around these issues, developing solutions together. Do you have some ideas about what you'd like to see Montgomery College doing in that space? You know, I, I think about this. I was a school teacher mm -hmm. and you know, I always thought, um, about how do you meet students where they are? You know, not assume that you're this or that, but what do you need? And, and you know, what, where are you starting at? And make sure that that doesn't count against you. And you, you, know, you all talked about how you know, the, the tests or the classes people take for no credits because where they're deemed not ready burns up money, burns up time, and can be really discouraging. So is there another way to start that? I think that you know, you've, you've built these marvelous campuses with an incredibly diverse population. Are we sure we're getting the message out to everybody that you need an historical perspective? Because this is what I think is lacking in, in America. I mean, you could say we're diverse and I could have a bunch of great programs here, but everybody needs to understand how we got here. Hmm. And you know, I, I feel like in the generation I grew up with, we were acutely aware of the civil rights movement. Um, I'm not sure that young people today are acutely aware of the civil rights movement. I'm not sure that people don't assume that this is the way America always was, except for this bad period of slavery, which we're not going to talk about. But everything has been, you know, fine, and look what I've got. And 
and not understand the struggle and the effort that it took to get this and not understand what's not been given so far. So you have the opportunity, I think, to educate a population that's probably hungry for understanding. I used to do things with my class to make to talk about these issues. I would talk about you know me being a 13-year-old kid in the class in Montgomery County, Montgomery Hills, in a civil rights debate where the pro con pro side was, you know, of course everybody should be free and vote, and the con side con side was that black kids, which they use a different word for, or black people, um, were a subspecies of human beings who were childlike and needed to be cared for. And I th always remember, the teacher didn't say, that's absurd. I mean, you, people don't know that it was only 50 years ago, and for some people still true today, when you could make that assertion, and people just say, yeah, that's what I think. Think how poisonous that is, because if those kids grew up thinking about that, what the hell did they pass on to their children? And, and you want to wonder why this stuff stays alive. Mm. It's because somebody who was my peer, who was, got the wrong information, grew up thinking that was the right way to look at things, looked at the unequal you know, position that people have in society, used that to confirm it. Because this is America, we're all equal, we all have equal opportunity. It's a given equal opportunity and everything, you're still down there and I'm up here, I must be better. So that confirms their bias and then they visit it on the next generation. You've got kids who do not know the history and I think it's part of all of our jobs to try to explain to people mm. that history. So I used to do this little exercise. I told my kids, so this is the day after emancipation and I'm a white guy in the class, so I must be the slave master and you guys are free. I said, where are you going to sleep tonight? You're going to sleep in my land. Who's going to decide how much it costs you to sleep in that shack you were sleeping in? I am. You're going to get up tomorrow morning. You're going to be hungry. Who's, who's going to feed you? I am. Who's going to decide what that costs? I am. Now you've got to pay me back. Who are you going to work for? Me. Remember, no, the, you, people weren't getting around the country in cars and picking mm -hmm. up and leaving the plantation. They didn't, ha they didn't even have a horse or a wagon to their name. So they're staying there. So now you're paying me. Who decides what your wage is? Me. That's what debt peonage was. We figured out a way to keep people perpetually in debt so they could never get off the farms that they were slaves on. This is part of American history. People need to know that so they can get a perspective of how things got this screwed up and maybe open up their minds to what you need to do to figure a way out of it. So I'm going to ask one last question, and then you all can be prepared to ask questions. We have a few people walking around with questions, uh, with the microphone, and or have received some via social media. Um, eight years, let's fast forward, as you just did. It's the day after the next county executive has been elected, and eight years from now, and you're saying, I got this done around this issue of racial equity in Montgomery County. What would you like to have said that you got done? I'd like to see programs in place that are game changers. I want to see early childhood in place and, and families have access to early childhood education. Um, that I think is absolutely critically important. Uh, I would like to see a change in housing policies. I would like to see more and more families owning where they are and beginning to feel part of the community. Uh, it's a big difference. If you're moving every year or every couple of years, you're never vested in your community. Mm -hmm. If you're a homeowner, don't mess with my property values. Mm -hmm. you know? I asked a group of people in an apartment one day, I was trying to help them buy their apartment building. I said, you know, you all, they live right behind my house. And I said, you never come to me, you don't complain about the drug dealers, you don't complain about anything. The moment you own this building, you're gonna be in my face telling me we're taxpayers and we're not gonna put up with this. <laughs> it is, and they all nod their head yes. And I'm thinking, you're human beings. You shouldn't have to put up with this period. You shouldn't have to be a taxpayer mm. to not put up with this. You should have, as a citizen of Montgomery County and Tacoma Park, you should have not put up with it because nobody should have to put up with it. So I'd like to see a change in housing policy that not only just because it's good for equity and economic reasons, because it vests people in the community. If you're vested in the community, you're more vested in the schools. You're not thinking, my kid's gonna be out of this school in two years. There's no point. This may be the place you spend 20 years 
and I want to make sure that it's the right place. Mm. So I'd like to make that stronger. I want to have uh, more job programs. I want to make sure um, that we're sending kids out of school ready, ready and able to work. I don't look at school primarily as a work thing. I kind of think it as a human development thing. But part of human development is developing a toolkit that you let you go out and work in society. So I want to make sure that every kid leaves high school knowing that they can do something and they can do something worthwhile and not that if they miss the boat to college that somehow they miss the boat to success in life. The kids need to know there are multiple avenues to success. I'd like to be in a place where we've started to move in that direction. I would like to see more work on the health disparities with a deeper understanding of what causes things. I think the discussion about mental health earlier from, from one of your students, mm -hmm. it's a lifelong issue for people. And, it's, and I mean lifelong on the bottom end as well as the top end. There are kids who get lost in school really early on. And you can think about the number of counselors and psychologists we have in our public schools. It's tiny. Yeah. So I'd like to see those things different. Um, and I'd like to think that people were beginning to think about things differently. Mm -hmm. And that's the hard one, because I don't have a lever or something I could do that I said, if I did that one thing, everybody would open, their, open up their minds and be able to deal with everyone else on an equal footing. Mm -hmm. That's going to take work. And that's, I think, our work, if we're serious about this. It's a lifetime of work, and it's not defined by jobs. It's defined by how we begin to talk about things and how we alter the milieu in which all of us are working. Mm. Thank you. That would make yeah, me that, feel good. That, I think you should write that down and put it on a post-it note. Seriously. So thank you so much for the insightful dialogue. We will have a couple of questions that I know people are burning to ask. Oh. I guess I'm first. Awesome. Um, County Executive uh, Elrich, thank you for having the courage to share your experience, um, vision, and vulnerability with us. Mm. Uh, that, that touched me, and I appreciate that. My question is, uh, how do we inspire in effective participation and action um, from the white males who should be here, who may think achieving equity and inclusion means less opportunity for them and their children? Mm. So, you know, that has been the struggle from the day they did it you know, required equal opportunity in employment. You know, the moment that the, the doors opened up and they said you have to hire equally, the response was, well, that's my job and my promotion I'm, the not, I'm not gonna get. Mm -hmm. I guess, you know, our job is to create more opportunities for advancement and, and improving oneself so one doesn't fight over the crumbs. But I feel that, you know, one thing, this system has been stunningly effective at, and particularly, I'd say, white racism is especially effective at is turning people against each other and saying, you're gonna take what I got. Meanwhile, there are people at the top <laughs> taking 99% of everything and, we're, <laughs> and right. we're fighting whether I'm gonna lose my little space in the world. We, we've gotta convince people that there's enough here. We need to change the broader system so that everybody gets to partake of what's here, that you're not left to fight against each other for which should be everybody's fair place at the table. Mm. Nobody should, you know, if you don't get a promotion, it shouldn't mean you can't buy a house. And I think people looked at promotions and things as their steps to economic opportunity and betterment. Just, just too little trickling down to the bottom. That would be a good thing to change. Mm. If you're watching online, please send in your questions also. We're monitoring Facebook Live and Twitter, so you can send in your questions electronically also. I'd like to take the questions over here, please. Yeah, hi. I was so glad, I'm Laura White, I work in staff training, and I was so glad to hear you talk about the importance of understanding the history of the county. We include that in our programs, but in the last two years, we've had an excellent speaker from the Native American Commission talk about the, all the different peoples that lived in this area and were displaced or moved here and there. and. Um, they want to come back. This is the first time that the Native American Commission is um, suggesting that they hold their annual event in November at a community college. Wow. So I would appreciate from each of you, this request, 
a letter to the Native American Commission that says we would welcome you in this county for this November event. Okay? Thank you. <laughs> Nancy? Hi, I'm Nancy Newton. I'm the Special Programs Development Coordinator. I can't remember what I do. Hold on. Special <laughs> Programs Director for Workforce Development, Continuing Education. And I was just wondering what your thoughts are on the um, disparity between sentencing for young African American males mm -hmm. and young white males. Um, we're very privileged here at the college to have a program that works with uh, incarcerated people up at Clarksburg and at the pre-release center, and the differences in the um, populations is astounding. So just wondering yeah. what your thoughts are on that. Thank you. My thoughts are that if the Justice Department ever <laughs> looks at this place closely, then we're gonna be in trouble. I mean, those, that all starts with um, arrest data, and I've seen some arrest data that people, I think, we're gonna to have to look at pretty seriously because it, it looks proportionate, disproportionate. And following, um, who gets, who gets, I say stop data. Stop data is disproportionate. Who gets charged is disproportionate. The severity of the charges appears to be disproportionate. And then of course the sentencing completes the uh, quadrifecta at that point. Mm. Um, I, it's a problem and you know on the one hand, I'm glad the police don't give everybody a ticket. I mean, it shouldn't be a ticket machine and people do stuff that's really not gonna jeopardize the life and safety of everybody. And it's okay to say, you know, you made a mistake, I'm gonna let you go, but that, that, that option should be available to everybody. And I don't wanna create a system where I say, every time you stop somebody, everybody gets a ticket and everybody gets maximum sentence. I'd like to see some compassion, but it's, compassion's gotta be for everyone, because this is where things get nuts. I mean, you drive yourself to the conclusion that if I can't be equally compassionate for everyone, then I have to become totally harsh with everyone. I would rather mm -hmm. just find a way to be equally compassionate rather than equally cruel. And uh, so it's, it's gonna be, it's gonna take some work. I mean, people, I don't believe the behaviors, the data shows that behaviors aren't all that much difference, but outcomes are. Hmm. We have one more question over here. Hi, I'm Roberta Buckberg from Student Employment Services, and this question is based on my lack of knowledge. I apologize of what the county is already doing um, and what your plans are, but we've got students um, and community members who have to have emergency plans because they're afraid that when their kids come home, they're gonna find their parents in ICE custody. What are we doing for our undocumented neighbors here in the county? So we, 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 do? we provide a lot of support to the nonprofits that support the undocumented community. And one reason we've done a lot of it through nonprofits is that if it's a government program, then names and addresses and information are available where somebody from Washington get to get interested in that information. When I provide money to a nonprofit, um, they provide a barrier. They're not able to go after a nonprofit and say, give me, at least so far, give me the list of who you're helping and what you're doing. So nonprofits have been a very good vehicle for us and we spend a lot of money um, trying to make sure the CASA and, and a myriad of other groups um, get resources from the county. And we continue, we get more requests than we can fund, but we're particularly aware of, you know, the family situation. And I think we're all worried about that. I think we have time for two more questions. Hi, my name is Nicole Brazell. Um, I work as an enrollment specialist, uh, particularly with the DreamOx students. And uh, earlier you mentioned early childhood education. Um, and I was just wondering what was your hopes for that because I have an autistic son who was detected early and that really helped him and it's gonna give him a greater opportunity as he's growing um, in one day, you know, when he's ready to come to a college, community college. So I'm just wondering what your hopes are for that program. 
So my hope is we, we, get, to, we get to grow it to scale. Um, you know, like my intellectual brain knows I need to do zero to four. My brain that's controlled by money tells me to start with three and four year olds. Mm -hmm. But the county does have a program um, that actually bases, bas focuses on um, young children with different abilities. And we actually have social workers or medical people and physical therapists and, and such that can go out and help individual parents. I know parents who have been helped by that. And so they try to identify um, disabilities as early as they can because a lot of times the earlier it's identified, the more effective um, interventions are. And the later it's identified, the harder it is to change things. So I would, I see that that particular intervention is a little bit separate and apart from early childhood education as a generic thing, but certainly if the doors would open, I'd hope that somebody who was enrolled would get identified if they needed support and we'd be able to steer them to more supports. We have one more question in the audience? Hi, thank Hi. you. My name is Marcy Jackson. I work in workforce development and one of the program areas I'm responsible for is entrepreneurship and small business. There is a national movement towards creating supportive structures for business and creating greater equity for businesses of color. Has the county um, engaged in any of those activities or are you aware of opportunities and what can we do to create more access and equity for businesses? So we're starting to change what we do in the small, particularly the small business arena. When we created the Economic Development Corporation, we more or less abandoned economic development as a county activity. And so when I came in, there wasn't much left of resources or people targeting that. So we've done two things. One is uh, Sydney Katz uh, has been working with me. We're doing a series of listening sessions mm -hmm. around the county, asking people what are the county barriers to starting a business? What makes, I'm not sure this is true, but people say Montgomery County is worse than everybody else. And so we're asking people, tell us your stories. Tell us what we're doing that's different. And at the end of the year, Sydney and I will introduce like regulations and or changes in law as needed to kind of bring us in line with the surrounding jurisdictions. We have a small business center that just opened up, or is it, it's the grand opening is this month in Germantown. I hope to, to spread a small business assistance to all of the regional service centers. There are five of them in the county. I'm really interested in incubator programs, um, opportunities for people to start businesses, and not just biotech. We, we do, I just came across from the incubator over here. It is a wonderful facility. We should drive that end of the economy as much as we can, but not everybody's going into that end of the economy. Um, I was in Baltimore at a place called Open Works, which is just an amazing place, almost 40,000 square feet under roof, 3D printers, room full of sew sewing machines, driven by computers, high-end cutting and machinery tools. And people come in there, hundreds of people come in there and learn how to work and, and develop skills and make products and sell products. So I'm interested in growing the economy from the bottom as much as I am from the top. The top will do, if we nurture the top, that's easy. I, I kind of know what to do up there better than what we've been doing at the bottom. But I'd like to see a much more robust economic development strategy that focuses on young people and opportunities to become creators in this society. Mm. Excellent. Well, if there are no more questions uh, from the audience, I think we are going to wrap up this part of our session today. I'd like for you all to join me in thanking Mr. Elrich for joining us today.